Hello, this is Juan Hernandez, and here we have the Chattanooga Football Club team. The club culture has always aimed to make a better world through the game of soccer by impacting and reaching to our community through the sport. Recent events in the light of Jacob Blake's are impacting our lives and other teams around NISA and the world. We, players, have a meeting yesterday to talk about how is this impacting us and how we want to approach this situation. Not only we believe that soccer has changed our personal lives, but all, also we have witnessed how soccer has changed an impact and brought together all levels of our community for the past 10 years. Within this set, we want to send a message as players and as organization in full support of the decision of New Amsterdam's choice of not to play. We believe unity and education are critical to help others understand and make a change. This is why we want to share some of our personal stories to show our involvement and our empathy. Finally, we not only want to speak, but we also will take action as how as a club, we believe we can be more impactful to our community so we can change lives one person at a time. Richard Dixon speaking. Um, First of all, I want to thank everybody for tuning into this live stream. Obviously, we were meant to have a game today. Um, we're not able to play, but nonetheless, we get to share a message uh, with you all. But first, we want to address the, the, the point of the game with playing New Amsterdam uh, FC today. Um, myself and the guys behind me, uh, we had every intention of playing that game. Um, had New Amsterdam come to town and decided to play, we were going to use that game, um, you know, that 2,200 fans in the crowd as a platform to send an even bigger message. But obviously, New Amsterdam decided not to, not to come to town, and we fully support that. So we want to take out the gray area. I want everybody to know that we fully support New Amsterdam's uh, decision not to, not to travel and not to play, and we fully support the message. Um, and so, in substitute for that, we, the players, we decided that it would be appropriate for us to share our feelings, our concerns, um, in light of everything that's been going on. Um, we know that when it comes to the issue of race, um, it's a very sensitive topic. It's a very touchy topic that people get, people tend to be uncomfortable. However, um, as we can see uh, daily on social media, on the news, things are happening, right? So there is a problem. Things are happening, people are losing their lives. And so we don't think as players that this will change unless we have those uncomfortable uh, conversations, right? Because there's many people that don't know, there's many people that don't understand, there's many people that don't care. But for the few that are curious, those are the ones that we wanna reach. Um, it really touches my heart whenever I show up to training uh, in the morning and I see one of my teammates, you know, that he's down and he's not able to work at his full capacity. Um, you know, over the last six months, I've, I've seen teammates break down in front of me, um, you know, crying, whether it's there at my house having dinner, just trying to get me to understand the mental, the mental abuse that they're dealing with, the emotional abuse that they're dealing with, just seeing this over and over and over again. And one of the biggest questions that they always ask is, like, when is it going to stop? When is it going to end? Is it, is it going to end when it's me, right? And those kind of questions, it, it, it hits home, right? It, 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 it digs you really deep. And so I have a group of men behind me. I have uh, an amazing group of founders and uh, supporters and staff that, you know, support the message. They support us on the field, on and off it. But we haven't had this conversation. And I think that today it's very important that you guys understand how we feel. You guys understand why we decided that we were going to play that game and the message that we were going to send. Um, because there's guys on this team standing behind me that have been through some tough times, um, whether it's personally, uh, whether it's family members, or whether it's just seeing one of your brothers, you know, losing their lives, you know, just just walking down the street. Uh, you know, we're all human beings and, uh, you know, we think that everybody deserves the right, deserve the right and the freedom to go out 
to go work, work hard to feed their family. And when you see that get taken away from a human being each and every day, something has to be said, right? There, there, you have to take a stand. And there's many teams around the league and around the country and around the world, right? Uh, peacefully protesting, whether it's taking a knee, um, you know, whether it's stopping at certain points in the game and coming to the center circle. But, but still, people don't know the why, right? What is the why? Why are these people doing these things? Because people don't take the time to go out and research. People don't take the time to go out and read. People don't take the time to go out and research the why. Because when you find out the why, maybe you understand a little bit more. Maybe you understand, maybe you understand these guys a little bit more behind me when I hear their stories, right? So that's the purpose of today is just to hear some stories, uh, share some concerns, and just explain why we decide to protest the way that we do and to support New Amsterdam the way the way that we do to support the the, the movement um, of human rights and, and that's it it's just simply human rights i would love to see each and everybody watching this broadcast each and every one of my teammates be treated the same way that i would love to see myself treated right i don't want to be treated less than any of my brothers because the color of my skin and vice versa i don't want any of them to be treated less or more because of the color of their skin so with that being said i'll just share one quick personal story that you know, I shared with my teammates yesterday, and uh, I think it's appropriate just so we all realize that none of us are privileged, right? Nobody is exempt. None of us are privileged. At the end of the day, when something happens to you and you're traumatized, your life is changed forever. And so I'll share a personal story that happened to me uh, last year. Um, many who follow me, they know that I had surgery last year on, on my foot. I was out uh, for about six months. Um, and, you know, just going about my daily rehab, 6 a.m. Um, at the therapy clinic, um, driving back home to go get ready and change to go support my teammates at practice. So I tried to speed through this. But on my way home, I'm about three miles away from home. I see an unmarked police vehicle driving the opposite way from me, right? All of a sudden, swoops around behind me and follows me for three miles. Every stoplight I'd stop, they stop. Every turn I made, they turn. And so, you know, just, I haven't broken any law, you know, I haven't set a foot wrong, you know, I tried to go about my day uh, doing every bit of good that I can. So I have no concern. Um, but as I'm getting closer and closer to home, I see that this is not right. This, this is actually, this could be a problem. Um, carried on about my drive. So I'm about half a mile. Um, from my, my apartment. And at this time, I'm, li I'm living with uh, Juan Hernandez, who's standing here behind me, who hadn't heard his story until yesterday because I didn't feel like it was my place to put my burden on him. But then let's talk about having conversations and being open and being vulnerable because when I act certain ways, maybe he knows that I've been through this, right? And that's the way, that's the reason why I act the way that I, that I have. So anyways, as I pull into the, as I'm about to pull into the parking lot away from my apartment building, which is 100 feet across the road, I see the unmarked vehicle take off, then out of nowhere, as I put my put my my head down to pick the phone up to call my wife, who was upstairs pregnant um, with my daughter, I pick my head back up, and there's six police cars out of every direction, just speeding out of no, out of everywhere, pulling up. So I pulled into the parking lot, still no worries, um, but then these men jumped out of their cars, went behind their cars, six guns drawn, pointed at me. Right. So at this point, I'm obviously fearing for my life. Right. Because I've only been I've been in America for, for 14 years and, you know, you've seen it over and over and over again. You know, and it's always people of color, um, you know. So at that point, I'm, I'm fearing for my life, you know, and, and I'm, I'm having my my wife is upstairs. You know, my my daughter is due two months. And that that's that was a thought just kept that just kept playing through my mind over and over. I, you know, I can't, this can't happen. You know, this can't happen today. Um, my, my daughter is not going to grow up without a dad. You know, um, I've done everything in my power to be, to be a good human being um, and to help others and to change all the communities that I've been in. But in my mind at that time, all of that meant nothing, right? Six guns drawn, get out of your car, put your hands in the air, walk towards me. Um, and I'm scared. I've never had an issue with the cops in my entire life. 
So I'm have my, my window down. I'm trying to find out why, why am I pulled over? Um, why am I here? What, what's going on? Explain to me, give me some reason. I couldn't get a reason, but just to fast forward, I ended up getting out of my car. Um, one of the officers was really aggressive telling me to shut up, just, you know, do what I'm told and, and all that. And then another officer, officer deescalated the, the situation. Um, and then, you know, he walked towards me. I walked towards him. Um, but then, you know, the police chief came, they went over and they talked to one another and they ended up, you know, coming over and told me, sorry, you know, we had the, the wrong guy. Um, you know, we had, a your car came up in a suspected homicide, um, you know, black guy, so-and-so. And so anyways, I took it for what it was, um, stayed back and, uh, talked for 15, 20 minutes with the other officer, you know, explaining why I reacted the way he reacted. Um, why they reacted the way I reacted. He explained that, you know, sometimes police, they, they don't know if I have a weapon on me. Bear in mind that I'm wearing athletic gear, like I'm playing, going to play a soccer game. I'm wearing soccer shorts and I'm wearing a really tight shirt, right? So you, if I had a weapon, you would have been able to see it. And so my question is, how do I pose a threat to six officers with gun drawn when I obviously don't have a weapon, right? And so how else should I have reacted, right? Um, and why, why is it, why is that the first thing that happens as soon as, you know, we see the videos over and over again, a person of color gets pulled over. You see the hands on the, hands on the gun, right? And you see the aggression, why? What, what, why is this happening? Um, what's the problem? Right. We know there is a problem. We know that these things are happening, but what's the problem? So I don't have the solutions. I have some ideas. Um, I was lucky enough in that situation to walk away with my life and I'm here with my teammates. I'm here talking in front of you guys today. Um, I didn't have thought in the moment that I, I, I was going to I was going to be here. Um, but others weren't that fortunate. Right. Others weren't that fortunate. We see the videos, people getting shot in the back. 12 year old with a toy gun, right? Police pulls up, just starts firing. Um, the drunk guy is sleeping in his car, didn't want to drive home. He shows a uh, cop show up and he loses his life at the end of it. You know, female sleeping in her house, loses her life. So these situations are happening too often, right? Too often. So there is a problem. I'm not a politician. We're not politicians. We're not lawmakers, right? At the end of the day, we're athletes. Um, we, we have a voice, right, that we can do certain things with. And I think it's appropriate that we have this conversation, right? Because when I show up to training and I see my teammates crying because they're, they're emotionally damaged by everything that they've been seeing, they can't work right? I think that's a problem, right? And so that's the reason why we do, we, we wanted to approach the game. That's the reason why we want, we wanted to play the game and approach it the way that we had planned. Those are the plans that we had. We wanted to send that message that it does happen, right? It does happen. But because I'm a professional athlete, I'm not exempt, right? Um, because you are of, you, you are of social status, you're not exempt. Because you might be wealthy, you're not exempt. Um, these things do happen. And um, I think it's important that we start having these conversations more often because it's uncomfortable and it's, it's tough and it's sensitive. But if we don't have the conversation, we don't grow. We don't come up with solutions. We don't get better, right? So how can we open up and how can we share and how can we educate one another right on each other's lives in each other's situations as many of my brothers behind me i don't know exactly what happens in their lives day to day or what they've been through in their childhood but i have those conversations every day and it helps me to understand them more when we step out on the football field when he reacts when he does a certain things i understand that because i know what he's been through so let's ha start having those conversations and that's the main reason why we wanted to do this um and so I asked for one of our staff members, uh, one of our leaders, Jeremy Alamba, to share his story, um, you know, of injustice that he's experienced growing up or any time in his life. So Jeremy, please. 
yeah, I want to thank Rich. Um, my story is, is not the same and other guys' stories aren't going to be the same as Rich's as well. And mine's a little bit more, I would say, about journey and about education uh, than probably anything else. So I grew up and I shared this with uh, Rich and Sean Reynolds um, when we first started having these talks about every two weeks, looking at what solutions can the club put together? What can we do? We've done a lot in the community over the past 10 years. And we need to do more. Um, so I grew up in a small town in Illinois. And before I went to kindergarten, uh, I lived in a little apartment and I had a buddy, Ronald. And he lived next to me. He was my buddy. We went to the park. Um, his mom babysat me. My mom babysat him. He was just my friend. His mom talked to him differently sometimes and my mom talked to me. He was Hispanic, but he was just my friend. And my dad and his dad sat on the front porch and drank beers. They would watch Soccer Made in Germany on PBS because it was the only way to watch football in the U.S. at the time. Um, but he, he was just my buddy. We moved to another small town, and I had new buddies. Most of them were white, like me. Um, it was a small farm town. Soccer was big. Basketball was big. But in fifth grade, something changed a little bit. Um, we had a family in town, and got, he was on the basketball team, Jim Edmondson. And we would go to these other small little towns and their gyms. And that's when I first saw people talking, whispering, people pointing. I never heard anything. I'm sure Jim did, but he carried himself with class. And he was, he was unbelievable. From there, we moved to um, Champaign, Illinois, because I think my mom and dad figured out that we need to get in a bigger city. We need to get around different types of people, different thoughts, different cultures. And I just made new friends. They were just, they were friends. Um, the girls that I liked were just girls that I liked. I didn't, didn't see anything different than I saw when I was three and four with Ronald. Um, run a soccer field at a tournament uh, outside of Chicago, big city. You expect big cities, people act and behave certain ways. And I just remember in the game, it was an ODP tournament. And I just remember my buddy, Patrick, walked over to my dad, who was a coach. And my dad's whispering to him. And my dad waves to me to come over. And he said, tell him what number. And Patrick's like, number seven. And my dad patted Patrick, probably kicked him in the ass to get back on the field. And he said, next time there's an opportunity to light number seven up, don't hurt him, but light him up. And then so from U12 to U19, me and other guys on the team, we just we had a code with Patrick. Somebody said something out of hate, out of racism. It was real simple. He would just flash what number it was, and we sorted out in the field. And we had to sort it out in the field because if he did it, he was the angry black kid that was playing too aggressive. If we did it, we were just the white kids playing hard. And that was the reality of the situation. I played with him until I was 19 years old. Get into coaching and all that stuff, same things would happen. I had hard conversations with opposing coaches when they would say something to one of my players, a Hispanic player, an Asian player, a black player, whatever it was. We, and, but the guys would usually sort it out in the field. To be honest, I hadn't thought about that until I talked to Rich and Sean about it in, in the office that day. And um, I was talking to my mom the other day, and she just said, you know, right now times are crazy, and the unfortunate thing is things go in cycles. And she was talking about when she was in grad school, finishing up college, and people would turn around and protest the national anthem and face the other way. People would ride on campus. People would march on campus because things were just not good. Things weren't right. And here we are again. So maybe my way of dealing with uh, racism with my um, good friend wasn't right, um, but I'm committed, and this club is committed to find right ways to deal with things and to put more things out there that can make this place just better. Because I don't want these guys to have to wave their daughter over when they're 12 to tell somebody to kick somebody because somebody said something out of hate, out of ignorance, out of lack of education. I don't want these guys to have to go through that. I want them to, you know, make this city, this community, and other clubs and other teams make their cities and their communities um, better places. So. That's it. That's me. Um, that's my scenario. That's my story. Rich. Thank you. Uh, how you guys doing? Uh, my name is Sean Russell. Um, I'm new uh, to the club and uh, I just want to thank, you know, the staff and the club and the owners to giving us today this opportunity, me and my team and this platform to talk about, you know, the social injustice against black people. Um, you know, 
want to shed some light on, you know, on the on the recent events of Jacob Blake and his shooting. Um, you know, it, it's it's sad that as black males, as black people in this country, that we have to wake up every morning fearing for our lives. Ahmaud Arbery just going for a jog in his neighborhood. Breonna Taylor sleeping in her house. George Floyd, eight minutes and 46 seconds with the knee on his neck. Tamir Rice, 12 year old kid, Trayvon Martin. This is nothing new to, to us in this country, but with the pandemic, it has given us and everybody in this country to listen to what's been going on to black people in this country. I shouldn't have to fear walking down the street. I shouldn't have to fear every time a cop pulls up behind me. My heart is beating. I have to clinch, not knowing if I'm going to go home. These are the problems that have been happening for years within the black community to us as black people. So, you know, I wanna, I wanna challenge to the white folks out there, you know, we may disagree. We're gonna have different, different views, but we wanna educate you guys on the history of what's been going on to black people. Can you just pick up a book and read? If you wanna have a conversation with someone that is black, ask them questions. Those are ways to learn and to educate yourselves on these issues. When I was 11 years old, I got called the N-word on the soccer field. I know what the word meant, but at the time, I didn't know what I could do about it. All I could do was just tell my coach. As I got older, started to read, started to learn. And it's, it's painful. It's painful that we're here talking about these issues that have been going on and nothing has changed. And as black people, all we're asking is change. We're, at, we're asking to be equal. You know, at the end of practice, we always say family, you know, these are my brothers, we're family, you know, so this club stands for family, you know, it's built on the community, you know, and we are a close grow that us as black people, we are hurting. And we want you out there to listen to us and to hear our voices and to just and to just listen that's all we're asking for thank you hi i'm brian beamett um and i just wanted to speak kind of uh on behalf of obviously we don't go through any of the injustice or any of the hardships that some of my black teammates, my friend, one instance that I unfortunately had to see it firsthand. Um, shortly after uh, the events that happened in Ferguson, I was in, in college, just about to graduate, and I was at a sporting event, and I was with one of my, my roommates, one of my best friends, and he happens to be a black man. And we're saying normal chants and bitter and whatnot at a sporting event when next thing we know, a couple of cops approach us, walk us outside. Um, at the time we don't really think anything of it. Uh, and then it starts to become a little more verbal in which they start saying some, some racist things and some inappropriate things that was more so directed towards my friend than myself when arguably I was more of the verbal aggressor out of us too. Uh, next thing I know, uh, my friend is on the ground in handcuffs and is pleading for them not to hurt him. Um, he, he's bringing up previous 
previous black men who were killed by police. And no matter what I said or did, they honestly didn't pay me the time of the, the time of day. It was their sole focus was solely to keep my friend down on the ground in handcuffs. Um, mind you, we were just enjoying a sporting event. My, we were about to graduate. My friend is actually wearing his graduation gown and cap uh, just because we were excited. It was, it was a happy time. And to see, to see something like that, and fortunately, uh, some staff and, and other people involved in the event came and defused the situation, and, but they still ended up carrying him off to, to jail where we had to go and, and help bail him out for, for literally no reason. Um, it was, for me, it was, it, it was eye opening. It, it, it's one of those things where I, I, I don't have to deal with that as an issue for me. Um, if he wasn't there, I, I'm sure that it would have been a shouting match and they would have probably just walked away. Um, but no, uh, that's, that's not what happened. So obviously as, as a white, as a white person, we, we don't know, we don't deal with that kind of issue. Um, and some of us may never even experience seeing it. And that's why I kind of wanted to speak out and say, uh, to reiterate what Sean said, just educate yourself. Um, education is, is probably the most important thing we can do right now. Educate, listen, and, and just be open-minded. Um, like I said, we, we don't know what they are dealing with and what my black brothers are dealing with. But the next time I see a shooting on, on TV, I can't help but thinking that could have been anyone I know. It could have been any one of my black teammates, my black brothers, and it, it scares me. It, it honestly, it terrifies me um, that it could, someone could be gone just like that. And I, I think it's important uh, as a white person to really speak out against that thing because Frankly, the black people have been trying to speak out and they're kind of getting pushed to the side and that's just not right. So I, I think that it's important that as a white person, you speak out against these things um, and things just need to change. So educate yourself, listen, be open-minded and, and speak out when you see these things. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody on the live stream. Um, first of all, I just want to thank God to bring us all here together, first of all. And um, hearing all my teammates speak and having a conversation with the whole team, you know, I really want to, uh, we really want to make sure that you guys understand that we're not asking for pityness or soreness. We just want you guys to be more involved and just be more active and be more engaged in what's actually going on in the real world. We're looking for support from you guys. We're not looking for pityness. You know, that's not what we want. Because regardless, we look up tomorrow, our skin color is not going to change. It's not going to change, it's gonna be here forever. And I'm speaking on behalf of my brothers because, like I told them yesterday, I look at every single one of them, not as color, for their name, for who they are, not for where they come from. Because at the end of the day, when we put on a jersey or we put on a uniform, we're all one. These are my brothers. These are my brothers. And as a whole team, as a whole family, as we call ourselves a family, this is when times we actually come close together. We cannot use this to divide us. This has to make us all come together to go forward. These times are not the easiest time periods, but this is these are time periods when we need each other even more. I just want to say again that we're not looking for pityness, please. It's just time for us to be, to enlighten ourselves and to just be more educated about what's really going on in this world right now. As a black man or as a Hispanic man or as a colored person and just in general. That's just all I have to say. What's up guys? <clears throat> What's up guys? Uh, my name is Wolf Williams. Um, 
when you look at me, what do you see? Do I fit the, do I fit the description of a suspect? A black guy, a guy with dreads, a guy five, between 5'5", five, 5'8", five, five, a guy between 20 and 30. When you look, when you look at me, what do you see? Now, let me tell you about who I am. I'm a son, I'm an uncle, brother, cousin, coach, mentor, athlete, intelligent, loving, caring, respectful, selfless, lighthearted, goofy, and I love to cook. And most of all, I'm a human being. Every day when I wake up, I fear for my life only because of the color of my skin. I was born in Monroeville, Liberia. Born there, but was raised in America. Growing up in Africa, I didn't know what being, I didn't know what white or black was. I just know what being a human being is. When I see white people come to Africa, I love them. We love them. I had the opportunity to come to the US when I was 10, 14 years ago. And I realized that some people, certain people don't like me because of the color of my skin. And I ask, I wonder why is it that People don't like me because of the color of my skin. I can't do anything about it. I was born this way. For many people, you get to go home, you get to take your, your work clothes off, but I don't get to go home and take this off. I'm this 24 seven. I'm this every day of my life. When Jacob Blake passed, uh, the shooting of Jacob Blake, I woke up on, on the Monday morning and scroll through Instagram, told myself, do not look at this. Cause I knew I knew a part of me, something, something was telling me, don't look at it. The moment I saw it, my morning, everything was just, it was just, it was ruined. Couldn't eat breakfast. Got in my car, I'm driving. I just started, tears just started coming down. I started bawling out, I started crying. And I started asking, I started asking, I started asking myself, how many more lives are, are they gonna take away? How many more mothers have to cry for their kids? How many more brothers, how many more sisters have to be taken? How many more fathers have to, have to watch their kids being killed, murdered in, on social media, how many more times do we have to see these things? But then when you, when, when you go on social media, you see people try to justify what's happening. They say, oh, maybe he, he could have complied. Or maybe uh, they start talking about this person history. And it's like, none of that really matter about their history. They're a human being. I'm a human being, you're a human being. And when we talk about Black Lives Matter, I don't think we're talk we're not talking about Black Lives Only Matter. Yes, people talk about all lives matter until my lives matter, until these guys' lives matter. Nobody's lives can really matter because if you're saying all lives matter, then if something's happening to my people, you should be outraged about it. You should be mad about it. You should be upset with me. Because if anything were to happen to any of these guys, we're going we're gonna to go to battle with them. When we see somebody take a cheap shot at anybody on this team, on the field, the very instant, everybody's, everybody's sprinting towards that person, whoever that person were, they're sprinting towards them and they're ready to kill that person. They're ready to hurt that person because nope, we're not going to stand for anybody hurting any, any, um, any of our teammates. And so... It should, I feel like it should be the same way. 
if any one of us is hurting, everybody should be wanting to stand up for justice for this, for us. And no matter, Rich said it, no matter your political views, no matter your religion, um, none of that really matters in this moment. This is a human right movement. This is about just being a common human. This is common human decency. Can you, can you look at the person next to you and you see them hurting and you say, wow, this person is hurting. I need to, I need to be there for them. I'm going to stand up for them. No matter their, their race, no matter their, their religion, no matter the political views, no matter if you, um, no matter of all, any of that, it's all about, it's all about standing for, for, for what's right. And any of these movements that's been happening, they're not asking to have more opportunities than the person next to them. All they're asking for is just to have the same equal opportunity, the same equal um, chance to have to be able to walk outside without having the fear for their life. When you get in the, when I was growing up, I was taught driving white black. Many of my many of my teammates don't know what what driving white black means, but when you get pulled over for, um, by a cop car, the very first thing you do, you make sure your hands is up and you're not moving, your wallet is visible, you don't reach for anything, and if you're telling the cop that you're going to grab anything, you tell them slowly, I'm going to take my right hand, I'm going to reach, and I'm going to grab this while, you're, while one hand is visible. Nobody should have to do that. Why, sh why should I have to fear for my life that I have to take baby steps to grab, to grab my wallet and hand it to and, and show my ID to a police officer? Why should the police officer have to fear that they have to unclip their, their gun to walk up to my car because I'm a black human being. Every day you see, you see this stuff happen, but it's like, how many more times is this going to happen? This cycle has been happening for years, over years, over years. My grandfather, every, my grandparents, my parents, they all went through this. Why do I have to go through this? Why do rich daughter have to go through this? Why do my kids have to go through this? My kids should not have to go through this. This is happening way too many times and it, and it needs to end. When does it end? I think the best way this is going to end is when we start to sit in, in, on the table, around the table, and start having uncomfortable conversations. Because I think for the longest time, we've been, we've, uh, society, people have been shying away from having these uncomfortable conversations. So now it just keeps going into cycles. And so until we start having these uncomfortable conversations, start talking about, yes, this is a black human being. And yes, he is black. And yes, he is white or she is white or he or she is black. Until we can start saying the word black, we're not going to be able to move forward. Until white people can accept the fact and say, hey, that's a black man. And, and until white people can accept that, hey, I am privileged. Not because I have more money than this person, but because when I step outside, my skin color allows me to have another day of life. That's what being privileged really is. I'm not privileged because when I step outside, I'm black. And when somebody took a look at me or when I'm walking down the street and the, and the, and the white lady's walking towards me, she's going to go to the opposite direction on the opposite side of the street because she sees a black male coming. When I step into an elevator, a, a, a white woman sees me in the, uh, walking in an elevator. She's going to grab her purse and hold it closer to her because she feared that I'm going to rob her. Why should that have to happen? She doesn't know me, but because of the color of my skin, she's already judging me. Because I have dress, she's already judging me. Because I wear earrings and I have dress and I'm black. And my pants is down, she's already judging me. It should never have to happen. Never. I should feel I should go to walk and feel safe. I should be able to see a police officer walk by and feel safe knowing that if anything were to happen to me, he's gonna protect me because that's his job. He chose to do that. Same way if I same way me choosing to wear CFC uniform, if I if I don't perform, then I'm not doing my job. My job is to entertain people on the field. And if, not, if, in, in, if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job. And if a police officer is there to protect me, 
and I feel scared that he's not going to protect me and that he's going to take my life, we shouldn't have to live like that. Not in this society. We shouldn't have to fear a police officer. We should, we should feel like we need to go up to him, shake his hands, have a conversation with him, and, and feel safe. That's the kind of world we, sh- we, we need to live in. That's the kind of world that Rich's daughter deserves to live in. That's the kind of world that our children deserve to live in. And so, so when you hear something happen to me, moving forward, if you hear something happen to me, don't judge me. Don't judge my background. Just know that I'm a human being. Just remember that. So I want to thank you guys for listening. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Behind me, um, most people might see a bunch of athletes, um, you know, entertainers, so on and so forth. I see real people. Every day I go to work with real human beings, with real feelings, with real concerns, um, with families, you know, with nieces and nephews and moms and dads, just like everybody else. So these are human beings, right? And whenever we see injustice, whenever injustice happens to one of us, just like on soccer field, it happens to all of us, right? Whenever one guy gets kicked, he should be the last one in line. Like Coach Fuller always tells us, he should be the last one in line, ready to get back at at that person. And I challenge everybody from, from, from here on out, you know, when we talk about making change and make having an impact and having an influence, I challenge everybody to now have those uncomfortable conversations, right? Let's, let's have these conversations that we just heard today. Let's find out from people what they're going through, how these things are affecting them. Um, why are these guys kneeling during, during the national anthem, right? Why, why are they doing these things? Talk to them, reach out, have these conversations, and the more you you understand, the clearer the picture will become. Uh, but how, how do we, as a team, right? We're, we're we're fortunate enough to be to be at a club, right? That's that's all about the human being, and I, I want to applaud Chattanooga Football Club for that. That's one of the reasons why I'm here, I'm playing for this club, because. This club is all about family. It's all about unity and togetherness. And it's all about reaching the human being first. Uh, we're playing for a club that <laughs> during a pandemic, there's people sending cones and soccer balls to kids, right? Just to keep educating them using soccer as a tool. You know, I've witnessed people out there in cars dropping off food in the, in the, in the under, underprivileged community. Um, that's how you impact change. That's how you touch a human being um, and that's how we, as athletes, as a team, I think we can help to impact change by going out in the community when we're allowed, um, and reaching the next generation, right? Reaching one kid who 10 years down the line, he's going to reach 10 kids and so on and so forth. So I just challenge everybody just to have those uncomfortable situation with somebody that, you know, give him a call, shoot him a text, check on him. How are you? Um, what's going on with your life? How's your family? Those things are very important. There's a lot of, a lot of youth, you know, in the, in the black and Hispanic communities that, that are right now growing up without a father at home, you know, and us showing up. And that's one of the reasons why it's, it's, it's so disheartening right now, us not being able to be in the community because that's where we can drive change right just being there as as somebody to look up to i remember as a kid growing up i didn't grow up with my father i came over to the u.s when i was 16 um just to live with my dad and we have an amazing relationship but there's a lot that i missed out on as a kid that i had to learn through my coaches right that i had to learn through strong male figures in my community and so i think that we have to we have to realize that (laughs) those things the little things that we can do right? Whether it's a kind gesture or just having a conversation, checking on somebody, it goes a long way, right? Having a conversation with, with a little eight-year-old and telling him that I think you can one day become a professional soccer player. That becomes 
that becomes a reality. That becomes a reality 22 years down the road because you're looking at him right now, right? Having a conversation with, with, with a kid that all they, they see is, is poverty, right? And, and this person got shot. This person went to jail. Having those conversations and letting them know that you can be something one day. You can be, you're going to become a doctor. You're going to become a lawyer. You're going to become an engineer. You're going to become a pilot. You're going to become a dentist. You're going to become whatever you want. Having those conversations, they go a long way. And so how do we change? Um, being this team, Chattanooga Football Club, as the players, I think having these conversations first amongst ourselves, having these conversations with the rest of our club, having this conversation with the rest of our community, and affecting change here in Chattanooga, right? Because we can't change what happened in Wisconsin. We can't change what happened in other communities, but we can change what happens here, right? And that change trickles out. So I just want to thank everybody for tuning in today. I want to thank everybody that are here for, for, for the support. Most importantly, um, and just let's try to make changes from the inside out, right? Going forward. And that, that's all we have. If anybody else has anything they want to say. All right. Thank you, guys.